Hey everyone, welcome to that Jesus podcast. We're joined in this conversation with our co-host, Titus Kipfer. How's the Commonwealth going there? The Commonwealth is pretty good. We don't have any like apocalypses of cold weather and, and no power. So we're doing better than some of the folks down south I hear. Yeah, over in Texas, it's pretty brutal. So I've been thinking about this. It, like I, I actually could have, I could Google this really quickly, but how cold is it even getting there? Is it just that whenever it gets below freezing, like they freak out or is it actually like really, really cold? Yeah, some of my friends in Texas were were freaking out because it was like 15, 20 degrees. And like 20 degrees, Texas is is very cold. We had 37 degrees this week, below zero, but um, that's nothing compared to 20 degrees above in Texas. So what exactly is freezing and, and making the power outages? Do they just not have like heat down there, I assume? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's primarily H2O that's freezing. And... Um, I think it's just really slippery and icy, and when you get ice build up on on power lines and stuff, they crash, and they don't have the infrastructure and ready response to deal with that. I saw a tweet from Ted Cruz. Apparently, California had some power outages, and Ted Cruz tweeted something about how you know they they can't even uh, keep power up in California. It's so bad um, <laughs> by now. So that that tweet didn't age well for him, I guess. <laughs> Well, Titus, we've talked about weather, we've talked about politics, so I guess for the trifecta, you should tell us about whatever book you're reading. Oh, yes. So I just finished a book called Kingdom Unleashed, and it was so good that I read it in like three days. I I seriously couldn't put it down. Was it a Um, book or a pamphlet? It was a book. It had a lot of pages, and um, (laughs) the pages were small, and it was very easy reading. Um, Lots of pictures? No, there were a few <laughs> diagrams. Nice. I do read a lot of those books too. Um, generally, when I'm reading, Zion comes up and, and demands that I read something a little more on his level, and so it, it generally gets interrupted a fair amount. But this book is about uh, disciple making movements. Are, are you like hmm. familiar with that fad in in global missions? Oh yes, disciple making movements, the spontaneous church growth. Yes, the spontaneous multiplication of churches, all that. Yep. Yeah, you sound very cynical about it. We had uh, <laughs> Johann Is there anything Gauss. I don't sound phys- cynical about? No, <laughs> you are cynical about everything, <laughs> um, including the, the most important command Jesus gave us, which is to go and make disciples. Actually, technically, that's not. So oh. Love, um, love the Lord your God. Father, what must um, I do to be saved? But we, we had uh, a, a dude who is, is very into that sort of... Um, mission work on the mm-hmm. podcast very early on. Did you yes. listen to my interview with Johann Gauss? Drew? Yes. I think so. <laughs> Sound <laughs> very unsure. Um but but he's experienced like really, really good results with this model in Africa. And um so I'd love to get these authors on to talk more about mm. that at some point because it was it was really invigorating for me to read. I think I probably have cynicism around that because um, what it usually feels like to me is, hey, look at how this is working in the majority world, um, in the majority world countries, and look at how these um, indigenous believers are, you know, spontaneously multiplying and the gospel of Jesus going out and building churches and church planting movements and on and on. And then the question is like, and so what are the white people from America going to do about it? And we try and fit ourselves into that narrative somehow. And I think the thing I'm cynical about is, have we actually figured out where white people fit into that narrative? But that would be interesting so, to ask our our friend Derek about. He's our our guest conversational partner tonight. And you also um, served overseas too, right, David? Uh, Derek? No, Calvinists don't evangelize because we don't think that's important. (laughs) Just kidding. Yeah, uh, I've been in Romania uh, with my family for two years. So, yeah, um, we've kind of gone through a lot of that type of thinking and and reading Mm -hmm. and stuff. So uh, we've asked ourselves a lot of questions about about what that looks like. So do you believe in, in church planting movements? I was trying not to take a side there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I believe in church planting movements. I think that's important, but I guess the question is, uh, 
do we do we import what we have because it worked here, or do we uh, do we try to be you know to to get leadership from over there to kind of take the lead? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, we we kind of land in the the category of let's try to train and facilitate leadership over there. Um, and and you know a lot of people point to to growth here. Like, you know, I could go plant a church and, and we'd have 100 people within a year. And it's like, well, yeah, but in the States, you're basically stealing those 100 people mm-hmm. from other churches because they got tired of consuming, you know, the music changed over there or something. So you've got completely different demographics and, and Christian background. Yeah, and I think for me, one of my frustrations with the church planting movement movement was that it was presented to me as a panacea for whatever ailed the Church of Thailand where I was serving at the time. And I think that something that that spontaneously erupts in a society, say in India or in parts of China, is amazing. But part of the reason it's it's erupting and, and multiplying in those contexts have to do with the context and the history and the society. And so it it's definitely a work of the Lord at the right time in the spirit of God meeting the opportunity on the field. But just because it's working doesn't mean that if it's not working in Thailand where the gospel has been for 180 years and is less than 1% Christian, if it's not working in Thailand, that doesn't mean that Thai people, Thai believers and expat missionaries are doing it wrong. And that was kind of the vibe I got. It's like, oh, you're doing missions wrong. You have to get church planting movements going. And if you just do it like this, then finally, after 180 years of abject failure in Thailand, we can tell you guys how you did it wrong and fix it. So so the, the attitude of the authors of, of Kingdom Unleashed is actually kind of the opposite. They're saying that God is moving in the global south in these ways. And what is the, the church in the global north doing since it's in such decline what are we doing wrong, and how can oh, wow. we actually learn from them? Um, so it's actually really cool, kind of the approach they came from. And another really interesting thing, I'm really into this book, so this this podcast is brought to you by Kingdom <laughs> Unleashed. Um, I'm, I'll be waiting on the check. But uh, a, another really cool thing is that it it has a, a, a kingdom, almost Anabaptist worldview. It was endorsed by Scott McKnight, and the authors quote, you know, N.T. Wright and Scott mm-hmm. McKnight, and talk about a holistic kingdom gospel. Um, and of course, from an evangelical perspective, but I've never really seen that, you know, the theology of, of Wright and McKnight and others like that combined with a lot of missional zeal. Like yeah. often those are two different camps. And so uh, it was really interesting to see that bridged in this book, which is another reason why I enjoyed it so much. Hmm. It'd definitely be worth checking out. Um, I, I've told you this before, Titus, and I apologize to our audience because the way God designed me, I I mm. hear a good idea. I know it's a good idea, but what I articulate is the problems with the good idea. And so you'll never yes. hear me say, that's a great idea. Let's talk about how great it is. I'm always like, that's a great idea. Let's talk about the problems. So yes. you're welcome, Glass audience. half empty. <laughs> Very much so. This is we We all know that about you, Drew. I'm not sure it's half. I'm not sure it's at 50%, but anyhow. <laughs> it's even less. <laughs> so yes, tonight we were not going to talk about missiology, but I, I'm interested in that book. So thank you for that. Uh, we are visiting with Derek Kreider. Derek is the host of the podcast, The Fourth Way, right? Correct. Correct. And, and tell us what The Fourth Way is. So it was uh, just my attempt to kind of... Um, put the issue of nonviolence into a podcast. And mm-hmm. I was kind of frustrated with, with, with my journey. I had to read quite a lot of books and articles and things to, to be able to form a coherent idea of nonviolence. And, and I know that a lot of people aren't going to take the time to do that. So I wanted to create a podcast that was really structured so that in, in short tidbits and in a formal case, you could kind of get through the topic. Hmm. Yeah, and I've really appreciated it. I, I've barely scratched the surface on your backlog of episodes because you're pretty prolific and there's such good content, but it's it's accessible and good bite-sized, but also very deep. So I really appreciate the Fourth Way podcast. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey toward nonviolence? Yeah. 
Um, I'll, I'll try to make it quick because I think um, I'm going to start pretty far back because I, I think it's going to weave in a lot of, of what you're trying to get to tonight also with um, Calvinism and ecumenicism. So I actually, you know, if you can tell by my name, my name is kind of deceptive because in your circles, it probably looks like, like uh, you know, I'm an Anabaptist with Kreider because I, I know that there are lots of Criders Germanic. in Pennsylvania. And um, yeah, yeah. So I'm actually from Pennsylvania, Lancaster County. I mean, stereotypical. Um, but I, I grew up in a non-denominational church, went to a Christian school. Uh, and, it, and it was an Arminian church. I mean, it was... It was like a Bible church, a Baptist church type thing. And so uh, I really, I, I was saved when I was, you know, I was saved when I was like three and I prayed mm-hmm. a prayer and I don't remember that. And my whole life, you know, there, there's no transformation because I didn't see what I was and what I became. So I struggled a lot with my salvation. And um, I remember when I was in middle school, I asked one of my teachers, I was like, how do I know if I'm, if I'm really saved? And he said, well, did you pray a prayer? I was like, well, yeah, I prayed a prayer. It's like, well, did you mean it? I'm like, yeah, I meant it. I'm like, well, good, you're saved, right? That should do it. <laughs> well, yeah. That, what else it. do you need? <laughs> right. I mean, repent and believe, and um, that's that was basically the gospel. And I was the kind of kid who asked lots of questions, and nobody ever really had answers or or felt comfortable mm-hmm. with with questions. So I was. I wasn't disillusioned with God, but I was disillusioned with Christians. Hmm. And so I, I uh, did some student teaching down in Mexico City um, with, with the IMB, which is the Southern Baptist Mission Board, mm-hmm. which is where I met my wife. And so she was, she was doing missions work there with the IMB. And um, so this isn't a knock on them. I hear that they've, they've changed some of what they do. But basically her job at the time was she would go knocking on doors and people would answer She'd ask in broken Spanish, you know, do you know where you're going to go when you die? And uh, yes. a lot of times kids would answer and, they'd, you know, they'd basically walk the kids through this without the parents around and anything. And then they'd tally how many people got saved that day. Mm-hmm. And so that, yeah. that kind of all came to a head. And, and I started, um, I heard this sermon by Paul Washer. Have you, guys, have you guys heard of Paul Washer at all? Oh, yeah. I know I've seen him in yep. some memes. He's a favorite okay. of the pod. So whatever you think about him, <laughs> Paul Washer, and this might make you hate him more because he, he uh, converted me to, to Reformed theology, <laughs> but um, he had this YouTube video called like uh, Decisional Evangelism, and everything he went through just absolutely hit the nail on the head in terms of, of my experience. And so when I started reading uh, Reformed theology, it was, it was really alluring to me for, for a number of reasons. So it, <clears throat> in, in my mind, it took the focus off of man. Um, a lot of times the Arminian way seemed humanistic. You know, if I, mm-hmm. if I just get the music right or if I do this just right and prod this or say this uh, just right, like I can get somebody saved. And so this, this kind of put the onus on God. Um, God's the one who was, who was responsible. Um, and, and I also found that Reformed people tended to, as I experienced it at that time, compared to my upbringing, they tended to be more intellectual. They embraced questions. They embraced um, you know, deep theological readings, which is, is not something that I experienced in my community. Um, mm-hmm. And then I, I also, I was, I know that some people think, well, if, if you're Reformed, how do you, how do you know that you're saved? But it, it kind of secured my salvation for me because, you know, on, on Arminianism, I was thinking to myself, well, how do I know if I mustered up enough faith to be sincere so that God respects that faith? Whereas on, on Calvinism, it's like, well, God gave me that faith, and he, if he gave me that faith, then, you know, I'm, I'm in his hand, and I can't be mm-hmm. lost. And so that was, that was um, compelling to me. Of course, now on this side of things, I'm realizing it's hard to, to get people to care about good works in, in uh, Reformed theology because it's like grace, 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 grace. It's like, yeah, but um, you, know, you, need, you need that sign of good works. But then as soon as you bring up good works, you're a legalist. So. Um, and then the, the fourth thing was I, I really loved how they incorporated church history. Um, it, I, like... 
church history when I was growing up was basically Billy Graham, and he wasn't even dead yet. Like that, that's how far back we went, right? It, it, it had no history, no roots whatsoever. But Reformed theology did. And of course, um, now, that, now that I've come to nonviolence, I realize that, that Reformed theology is basically Jesus and Paul, and you get to Augustine, and then you get to Luther, Calvin. So mm-hmm. you skip quite a lot of people. You kind of cherry pick some guys. But um, so for me, I think like a lot of people who I've, I've talked to in the nonviolent community um, who, who didn't grow up Anabaptist, the, the 2016 election was a big deal for me because I, I realized, I remember um, one of my teachers had a poster up in the classroom that said, you know, integrity is doing the right thing even when it, it um, doesn't get you anything. And so then I'm thinking at, in 2016, I'm like, holy cow, we've got all of the Christians are telling me to vote for Donald Trump and look at all of this. And, and the reason that they're telling me I have to do it is because we have to win. Right, so integrity is doing the right thing even if it costs you something or even if it doesn't get you something. I'm like, well, where's our integrity? And so I started reading, um, I actually contacted followers of the way because I, I saw a, um, their debate at Harvard and mm-hmm. I contacted, and of course Matthew responded to that. And um, <clears throat> he, he told me to read Yoder. And so I read Yoder and, and from there I just, I realized that we're consequentialists and uh, that kind of started me down the path of, of looking more into church history and, and everything. So let's, let's go there a little bit with, with the consequentialism, because I know that's a, a big deal for you on your podcast. And when I, you know, I've, I've done some debates myself, and I don't really get into the ethics part of it. I'm, I'm just sticking with, with Jesus's teachings and, and church history. Um, but maybe just give like a, in, in a quick nutshell, why the, the ethics piece of it is important to you. I mean, obviously it's all ethics, but like more, more of those formal terms, you know, of, of consequentialism versus, you know, other yeah. ethical frames. <clears throat> I mean, consequentialism is, in my view, it's basically in the, the tree in the Garden of Eden, right? Well, God said, don't eat this tree, to eat from this tree, but I determine good and evil for myself, so I eat of it because it's good. I, I determine that it's good. And if, if, if we believe in objective morality, then what God tells us to do um, is, is something that objectively we should do. And I, I can't work my way around that. I can't, I can't uh, excuse that because um, I just find that, that Christians excuse a lot of different things because we determine good and evil for ourselves. Um, and, and honestly, nonviolence doesn't make any sense if, if you're going to be a pragmatist or a consequentialist because it doesn't make much sense. Um, it seems stupid. Because mm-hmm. it costs you something, right? I mean, it's yeah. not easy. How was, how was your move toward nonviolence received by your community? You were in a Reformed church at this point? Correct, yeah. And I, I don't um, know, help me with my ignorance here, but there's not an especially rich tradition of nonviolence in the Reformed tradition, is there? No, from my understanding, Spurgeon uh, was, was um, if he wasn't a full pacifist, he, he at least has quite a few quotes about war and, and stuff. So Okay. Um, but uh, other than Spurgeon and currently Preston Sprinkle, mm. yeah, I don't, I don't know anybody that, that would be pacifist. Okay. So I, I think, um, you know, I, I looked in the, so the Westminster Confession is a big thing for us. And, you know, I looked in there, I was like, so, so do, I, do I have to tell them that, um, you know, I, I can't be a part of the church anymore? And, and they say a lot of really bad things about Anabaptists, actually. If you read the footnotes in the Westminster <laughs> Confession, they, they really don't like them at all. But, uh, you know, that's not part of the main, the main confession or anything. Um, so yeah, I think I'm kind of that just that weird guy who has this this uh, topic that he likes to talk about that we don't really want to listen to. Um, okay. So ignored, I would say it's it hasn't been received badly, just largely ignored. Yeah. And that's interesting because for me, nonviolence 
has such a practical impact about how I think and how I interact with people. But for your community, it's a little bit more theoretical. Like, you know, say somebody arguing for a non-eternal conscious torment view of hell. It's like, okay, cool story, bro. But, you know, we have to, (laughs) we have to continue here. Do you feel like nonviolence has a profound impact on your daily life? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because, so I, I've been listening to some other people who aren't Anabaptists, but who've become pacifists. And hmm. there are quite a few who who equate either um, working with the poor and then becoming nonviolent or being nonviolent and then having this heart for, for those in poverty. So I was actually on our church's diaconate. For mm-hmm. for about two years before uh, before coming to nonviolence, and that was the first dissonance that I felt before the 2016 election, where I was like, "We're we're not really loving people. Like we're not really helping people." Um, you know, w- w- reading the Sermon on the Mount and then working with poor people really builds some dissonance in, or it should build some dissonance in a lot of us as Americans. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the the way that I view other things, if I take Jesus seriously on nonviolence, poverty comes into play. Um, how how I discipline my children comes into play. How I speak of people. So yeah, I, I think it it impacts a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. So we actually, I, I actually started interacting with you in some conversation um, <clears throat> privately about. What dividing lines we take theologically and in our practices, and how do we sort through what's a primary and what's a secondary issue? The the fancy word uh, we often talk about, uh, and I could be misusing it and mispronouncing it, so that would be great. Uh, adiaphora, um, issues that are you know important but not necessarily dividing lines in quite the same way. And for me, nonviolence, while I can recognize and appreciate a wide range of Christians that reject nonviolence, I, I, would, I think I would struggle to work closely and deeply with them. But it feels like you've, you've kind of found a way. You're actually a missionary for your church that doesn't have the same conviction around nonviolence as you do. How does that work out for you? Or how do you see it working I out guess in the future? It, I guess even? it helps. Yeah, I guess that it helps that they're not... Um, in the doctrine, uh, they're not actively opposed to it. It like doesn't prohibit it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so I guess while while we're a missionary in to the Romanians, we're also missionaries to the Reformed people. <laughs> um, they might not appreciate me couching it that way because uh, Americans and Reformed people don't need missionaries, right? Definitely um, not. That was sarcasm. You might not be able to to hear that. I have a pretty pretty even tone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, there are actually some people that I've, I've talked to within our church or within our denomination who have started to lean that way and to understand, hmm. to understand what I'm saying and to maybe not be at a place where they could enact nonviolence in all situations, which, I mean, I don't know if I'm there, if I, mm-hmm. what I would actually do, but, um. Yeah, so I think I think the Reformed Church is a mission field for nonviolence. Titus, where so do I guess, you draw? Yeah, it depends on if you want to be. A... Go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry, separatist or, or Puritan? You know, yes. Do you, do you, can you work from the inside of a church? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Titus, would you be willing? How closely would you be willing to work with somebody who, who didn't hold to non nonviolent responses to evil? Yeah, I mean, I think it would depend on the situation. Like, I'm trying to think. If if I was, for example, moving to India and couldn't find any Anabaptists to go join the mission there with me and couldn't convince Drew because of his hardness of heart, and therefore I had to go find some Protestants uh, to plant a church there with me, I mean, that would be just a, a, a lot of conversations that would have to happen because often, like, theological views come in packages. So if someone doesn't believe in nonviolence, 
Um, often there's a lot of other differences I would probably have with them. But if they were basically on the same page with me on everything except nonviolence, I think I would probably be okay with that, like with, with working together with them, being part of the same church and all of that, as long as they're not actively teaching against um, mm-hmm. Christian nonviolence and teaching the just war theory, or um, as long as like when pastoral situations come up like a, a police officer or a member of the army wants to join the church as long as we're agreed on, upon like what we're going to do in those situations i wouldn't be comfortable you know for example having a, a soldier who's actively serving um celebrating the eucharist with me is at least not if he's you know killing people on a regular basis which most soldiers are not doing in in peacetime so i don't know that's kind of a convoluted answer to that question i guess Yeah, but I think it does highlight the reality of how convoluted it can be, which is something you and I have been wrestling quite a bit with, Titus, uh, just inside conversations and even in our church situations. What what does it look like to be a church with with unity and with theological integrity without being a jerk about it and without cutting yourself off from the whole rest of the world and saying, I alone am the one true church? So... Mm -hmm. um, one thing that that uh, Derek you shared was kind of approaching it from instead of asking what the particular beliefs are that create dividing lines, you're asking what's the particular practice. Can you can you share some of that? Yeah. So when when we were talking the other day, I mean, this is an issue that I've I've thought about before, but never really, really, really thought about it. Um, hmm. I just kind of thought, well, how, how do you know? But uh, when we were talking, something kind of clicked. Like, I mean, the, the Bible doesn't give you some like clear statement of you know, kick people out of the church if they don't believe in the Trinity. But it, it does tell you um, a couple things that I think can, can shed light on, on what we should value. So I, uh, the, the Bible talks a lot about false teachers. So what, what are the false teachings that the Bible is concerned with. You know, I think looking at that is, is helpful as to what should be important to us. Um, the, the other thing that I, I think would be important would be uh, what are the qualifications for leadership? Because mm-hmm. if they're leading the church, the things that, that they're to exemplify are probably like the, the, the biggest things that we really need to focus on. And then... Um, you know, the, the third thing would be looking at early church documents like the, the Didache or, or whatnot, uh, which I know we could argue about how representative that is of the whole early church and whether that's just a local church document or not. But reading some early church documents, I think, would be helpful as to what, what they valued. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of the process that I came up with at the moment. I don't know if that, that works or not, um, but I think it's kind of a start. And practically, to to zoom in on your second point there about leadership, like the very word leader, church leader, is what direction is the church going in? So you would expect a little bit more fidelity, both both theologically and especially in practice, um, from somebody who's leading the direction of the church. And I think far too often we, well, if you don't line up with me, maybe we have a we need to think about what our views on leadership in the church are too. Um, because it's like, well, if you don't agree with me, I, I can't fellowship with you, but are you actually, are your different beliefs actually going to profoundly change my life? But um, what are some of the requirements for church leaders that would set, shed some light on this, Derek? I mean, so if I think Timothy and Titus are, are two of the biggest places that you can look and there, there aren't, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but um, you know, from most of the things that I can think of are, are practice-based things, yeah. like not being given to much, much wine, having control of your family, um, uh, not being quick, I think quick to anger is in one of the, the places, um, not, not living in debauchery. Like there, there, there are all kinds of things that are listed and there's not much content there that is is belief based, other than um, I think there are a couple of places where it says, "Don't deny your master, the master who bought you," which are in the false teaching passages. 
Um, yeah, m- the vast majority of stuff you're going to find in the false teaching passages and in, in the leadership passages are practice-based, not, not theological content. I think you go even one step further and say that, like, especially, um, well, both Timothy and Titus, again, they emphasize that a Christian teacher shouldn't be teaching divisive false doctrine. And again, for Paul, it felt, it seems like so often false doctrine in his mind was doctrine that divides. That doesn't mean our doctrinal positions don't divide, but he's talking about, you know, paying attention to myths and endless genealogies, empty speculations, thing like things like that, rather than, you know, <laughs> you know, some of the nuance around like a particular particular understanding of the economy of the Trinity or or perhaps, you know, are you, since you're a Calvinist, are you supralapsarian or infralapsarian? Both are wrong, but um, if you actually hold to Calvinism, then you're like, those are some of the things that can be more divisive than helpful, I think. Titus, would yeah. you worship with a Calvinist? Yeah, I, let, let's go there. So, <laughs> So, Derek, I, I I think it's very generous of you uh, to come on this podcast right after that that last episode we dropped, literally titled "Refuting Calvinism," in which uh, there was some very invigorated uh, opinions expressed on the topic of Calvinism. Um, I'm I'm curious. I'm I'm skillfully avoiding Drew's question, um, but I'm curious, like how how that felt to you to hear that from from folks that you know you have a lot in common with when it comes to a Christian response to, to violence and um, even like a, a third way approach to politics or a fourth way I guess um, so you you obviously have a lot in common with us in those areas but to hear us ranting um, and bashing Calvinism that directly how does that feel to you um, and and yeah how did how how would you respond to some of those critiques? I mean, I think I think ten years ago, it, it would have been hard. Um, but then I would have thought that you guys weren't Christians too, because you know how can you be Christians if <laughs> if you need to keep doing good works to keep hmm. you saved? Isn't that work salvation? Um, so I think I think I can deal with it because I I agree with you guys on on quite a lot of things like. Yeah, that that is hard for me to comport a God of love with a God who selects a certain group of people to be saved. Um, I I get it. Like I struggle with that too. Um, I think the 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 difference for me is that so so I I understand where you're coming from. Um, but then I also I also feel like you get get some things wrong. I I don't think you you guys always realize. Uh, the problems with your own, yeah, own ideology, and so for me, I'm kind of like, well, yeah, I'm I'm over here as a Calvinist, but I really get some of the things that you guys are saying, and I feel like the answer is probably not Calvinism or Arminianism. I think it's mystery, and I think it's somewhere in between those things, and we kind of pick camps and um, and just kind of serve God and and try to live out the gospel in one camp or the other, one flawed camp or the other. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, and, and to directly answer your question, Drew, yes, I would worship with the Calvinists. <laughs> it's actually far less important to me than than uh, nonviolence. Like, I would be much more concerned about worshiping with someone who didn't believe in nonviolence than worshiping with the Calvinists, simply because, mm-hmm. to come back to some of the things you guys have been mentioning, Calvinism is is much has much less to do with how one actually lives his or her life than Christian nonviolence does. So, Yeah. And for me, I, I spent quite a while engaging, not, not deeply like, like I'm sure Derek would have, but for, for a guy in his, you know, teens engaging really deeply with John Piper and RC Sproul and, and some others like that, James White, who's uh, Titus's personal favorite. Um, <laughs> but, yes. but for me, I really resonate with what Derek said because I do find some profound gaps in the stereotyped Arminian approach to the sovereignty of God and the character of God. Um, and I, and I, it's not just a stereotype because it's what I grew up with 
And when I was presented with, you know, John Piper's book, Desiring God, it was like, wow, this is <laughs> this idea that we can find worship and delighting ourselves in God and God wants us to delight in him and everything revolves around God glorifying himself because God is so intrinsically good. That that was profoundly influential and I never heard something like that in my my Church of Christ <clears throat> or in the the typical evangelical Christian radio um I would have listened to Chuck Swindoll, you know, stuff like that. And it just really invigorated me to to see God as more than myself. And so then I kind of started to swing back the other way when I when I dug even further into some of the theology of John Piper. And yeah, I, again, James White was helpful in turning me off of Calvinism to some extent. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, I, I feel like we do miss out on what, what our own blind spots are. And for me, finding one of the one of the things that's most helpful for me in doing theology and working through issues of application and dividing lines is to be willing to appeal to mystery. I would put it this way, I need to be willing not to answer all the questions and just say, well, I don't know. Scripture doesn't answer that question in a black and white way, so I'm not going to answer that question in a black and white way. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was void. Like what happened between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2? I don't have to answer all those questions to know that God created the heavens and the earth. And that may be a chicken, uh, you know, it's sort of a chickening out to get around it. But I approach, I approach um, God's predestining us. I approach um, how God's sovereign and yet we have free will in a similar way. If scripture doesn't answer in a black and white way, I don't have to answer it either. Yeah, may, may I give an example that I think would be helpful? Absolutely. Um, so, so a lot of times I think uh, Arminians tend to couch Calvinists as, as cold-hearted people who, you know, how, how could you worship a God who elects people to go to hell? And I, I think, I don't think this is the reason Calvinism came up, but I, I think um, what Calvinists try to do in part is to save the definition of love. Um, hmm. So... I agree that God is love. And for me to imagine God, like, like most Armenians I know believe, for me to imagine God throwing people into hell for all of eternity and to call that love for them, it just it doesn't comport with my intuition of what love is. Um, and likewise, for you guys, for Armenians, to think that God would only love some and not others it, it blows away your definition, your intuitive definition of love. Mm -hmm. But we're both really trying to preserve the definition, right? I can't see how God can send people that he loves to hell to be tortured for all eternity. And you can't see how God is selective in his choice. Um, mm -hmm. And and so... So how both, does how does Calvinism... How does Calvinism help that, though? Um, like, are you saying that God just simply doesn't love everybody? Or so a lot of Calvinists would say that... Um, they divide it into two types of loves, yeah. right? So they would they would say that God, um, you know, He's got this grace where the the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Like, yes, God has this this love that kind of blankets everybody, but then God has a super elective love, whatever. Like in Ephesians one love, where He He chooses some in Himself, um, and so that that doesn't sit well with me either. Like, mm -hmm. I, I feel like a lot of Calvinists probably say, well, yeah, that's just the way that it is, that God can do whatever he wants. And, and I feel like that's got to harden your heart to be that, um, that cold to it because it, it bothers me. The problem is the other side bothers me too because that definition of love um, has problems. Unless you're a universalist, which I, I would love to be, but I can't find scriptural, enough scriptural support for. Um, unless you're a universalist, you've got, you've got some anti-intuitive definitions of love. Mm -hmm. Well, embracing intuitive, I'm sorry, not anti-intuitive. <laughs> embracing conditional immortality like Titus does um, helps helps alleviate some of the cognitive dissonance, right, Titus? Yeah, I was I was gonna say that. Um, I, I I agree with you that you know torturing someone for eternity that you love probably doesn't 
doesn't make a lot of sense. But I'm I'm still kind of curious w- what Calvinism versus Arminianism has to do with this, because couldn't an Ar- Arminian say that as well, that God has this special kind of love for those who freely choose him? Um, like, like what, what does Calvinism have to do with that problem? So God, like God has a, like God actually loves some people and kind of loves other people. Yeah. How, however you framed it, it's, it, which I wasn't real comfortable with it and, and you obviously <laughs> weren't either, but, um, yeah. But I guess for for a Calvinist, God would kind of love some people and really love others before they become or, or before they ha- place their faith in Him. Um, whereas, couldn't an Arminian have the same understanding of it and just say it's after they freely choose Him that that God's affections are de- delineated in that way? <laughs> I I guess so, but I I mean, what what would that wouldn't that kind of undermine? the resentment that a lot of Arminians feel for Calvinism if, if they're both kind of the same result? Yeah, so I, I to be clear, I reject that delineation of, of God, you know, kind of loving some people and, um, and really loving others. I, although, no, but, but to answer your, your last question, I, I think I'm following what you're saying. Um, I think the reason why we're more comfortable with the Arminian position um, is because it's it's based on something that the free agent did, which is where Calvinists really freak out, you know, works righteousness, right? But Synergism. It's, it's, yes, it, it's based on our free choice of God or that he has that special love of a father and a son with us. And if we choose to reject him, then in a sense, hell, even if you believe in conditional immortality, is a removal of God's love. Like when God judges people and damns them to hell and they perish in hell, like the scriptures clearly teach, uh, I, I do believe in a sense he's removing his love. I don't, I don't think you can kill someone and love them simultaneously, right? I mean, we believe in nonviolence, so, and that's one of my primary arguments. Um, so I, I hear what both of you guys are saying. Um, I can think it kind of comes back even to what we talked about earlier on about um, the, the tension that I feel about like these church multiplication movements versus like, you know, let the hand of God do what he does. And and to not, not to sound too Calvinistic because I still want to be David Eicher's friend, but um, I, I think that sometimes we neglect, <laughs> you know, Titus, you've been very, very critical of the American church as a whole. I think the American church as a whole and the the condition it's in today with its nationalism is quite a bit more closely tied. Responsibility for the church falls more at the feet of Arminian type, uh, synergistic type theology than monergism. I I think about Charles Finney, right? And Charles Finney is kind of an archetype of everything that's wrong with Arminianism. And this is where we get to talking about how theology does matter and Finney as a profound leader and a very gifted charismatic leader of the church, uh, you know, revivalist who basically felt like, you know, whatever means necessary to bring someone to know Jesus, revival is not a miracle. It's not a work of God. It's a, uh, how did he say that? A purely a philosophical result of the right use of means. That was his view. And so he totally took God out of the picture in favor of emotional appeals. And I'm not, I don't think I'm really misrepresenting Finney, uh, Charles Finney either. So, so I really do believe that theology matters, especially in leadership. At the same time, one of the goals of this podcast is to sort of boil down to the essence of practically what does it mean to live out Jesus? Just last Sunday, I preached on the end of Acts 2. We're just beginning a series through Acts. And just the simplicity of what the early church did. They had koinonia. They had fellowship with each other. They helped each other. They praised God. They met together. They hung out together. They broke bread together. And really, the the primary jesus thing they did was listen to the apostles' teaching. And what's the apostolic teaching? It's about Jesus coming as a man, as prophesied by God, 
and taking our sins upon him and inviting us to join his kingdom. So (laughs) I'm like, theology matters because it exists. Like the only reason theology matters is because there's bad theology. If we didn't have bad theology, then we wouldn't have to spend as much time talking about good theology. And I'm using theology in a sort of popular level way, not the actual root meaning. Yeah. And I mean, I, I agree. I agree with you. And I think from, so from the example that I gave about the Arminian and the Calvinist, I think the, the whole point is we both believe that God is love, like to the mm-hmm. nth degree. That is who God is. It's, it doesn't describe him. It is, it is him. Um, we just are trying to figure out how he's love. Like how, how do I explain that? And not mm-hmm. that that's unimportant, but it, it seems petty to me that, um, some people in in our denomination, like our, our missions organization works with charismatic groups in other countries. Like it's amazing on the mission field, like you work with all kinds of people. Absolutely. Um, but if, if supporters hear that you're working with certain types of people, it's a problem. And that seems petty to me when, when we're letting the kind of nuances and hows impact trying to, to spread the kingdom. Hmm. Yeah. And I think Titus, that's what you're wanting to do to say, let's spread the kingdom. Let's be devoted to Jesus. Let's live out the commission, live out devotion to Christ. Whether we find that in Calvinism or Arminianism, or, you know, even, you know, stretching at the edges, talking with Kimberly a few weeks ago and her appreciation for some of the Catholic church tradition she had. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think we can do that while still um, engaging in theological questions in a robust way and, and critiquing mm-hmm. ideas that we don't agree with. So, for instance, in our last Absolutely. episode, we we heavily critique Calvinism as an idea that we don't agree with and that I genuinely think is a harmful idea. At the same time, someone like Derek, who holds to that idea— I genuinely consider my brother in Christ who's doing really good work, you know, uh, as far as his, his missions work and his podcast and all of that. So I think we can criticize ideas, and if we're not personally attached to those ideas in an unhealthy way, hmm. um, then someone like a Derek can come on to a podcast that just bashes one of his theological points and, and not be angry about it. Um, so, so yeah, we, we really do appreciate that, Derek. I mean, I... <laughs> I, I was going to ask you this question, but maybe I'll just make the observation that a lot of times Calvinists, is, especially some of the more hardcore ones, kind of come across as jerks. <laughs> so, you know, James White and you know John MacArthur, I'm, I'm really naming names here, aren't I? Um, so I, I don't know why that is. Like, what, I, like we've, we've talked about this a little bit, that theological positions often come in packages that are associated with tribes. And so I, I don't know why that tribe sometimes comes across that way, but you definitely do not fit that stereotype. So oh, you didn't know me 10 kudos years ago. to you no. there. <laughs> well, Titus, I have to push you. I have to push you just a little bit harder. Do you think, and I know Derek can teach us a lot about non-resistance and nonviolent responses to evil um, and a bunch of other things. Do you think you can learn from Derek in his Calvinism and about the sovereignty of God? Yeah, so some of the challenges <laughs> that we had in the, the Facebook chat on our Facebook page, I, I think were legitimate challenges that mm. he brought up that I've thought about a lot before. Um, and, and we could go there and have a whole discussion on that, which would be interesting. But yeah, ab- absolutely. And I've been, I have been influenced a lot by Calvinists, by John Piper, by Paul Washer, yep. um, David Platt, Francis Chan, who's not very Reformed anymore. Um but a lot of the, the my favorite teachers when I was first uh, really getting interested in the kingdom of God were Calvinists. Um, so I've learned a ton from them, and and just the the passion for the glory of God yeah. and the sovereignty of God. I mean, I just started reading When Helping Hurts um, today, and and David Platt had a little foreword. And whenever I read David Platt, man, the guy's passion for the urgent needs of the world is so real. Um, I haven't I haven't seen or or heard you know many Christian leaders with that same urgency. So um, same goes for Derek. We we can all learn from each other. Now on the you, your question though was on the specific issue of Calvinism. 
Well, yes, or at I, least I guess. the sovereignty of God. Yeah, <laughs> sure, we can we can do that. Not not okay. be so man centered like we always are, right? Well, I feel yeah, like ar- around here uh, we we've got a saying sometimes. Like some people say, uh, "Live like an Arminian and pray like a Calvinist." You know, live like your decisions matter, <laughs> but pray like God's actually in control and can do something about it. Hmm. Um, which I know that I know that you would disagree with uh, the way that that's couched. But... <laughs> I, yeah, I think I think word. that that's good. Like, there's a church in our area that's that's very Wesleyan, and the stuff that they do for the community is is out of this world. Hmm. Um, but I'll find people in our church kind of make fun of it and you know talk about how it's just a consumer church and you know their music. They just try to draw people in with their music and their warehouse church, and and some of that stuff might be warranted to a certain extent. But they're actually doing stuff. Yeah. Um, and we call ourselves the frozen chosen. We're um, just kind of very heady, stick to ourselves. It's not that we're not generous and stuff, but it's, it's hard to turn out. Um, but we, uh, you know, we're very solid in terms of trusting God and uh, going through difficult things and stuff. Hmm. So not, not that Arminians aren't, not that we don't do anything, but I, I think there are stereotypes for a reason. And I think I'm I'm learning from Arminians uh, a different sort of passion and and practice that is important for me. Well said. Well, can we just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya together? Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's been a great conversation. I feel like in some ways we've just scratched the surface, but it'll be something we continue to tackle. And for our um, listeners, if you have any thoughts on how how lines are drawn, what are the primary, secondary issues, what are theology dividing lines in your mind, and what aren't. We'd love to hear input or um, ideas for future guests, and I hope we get you back on again, Derek. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Titus. Absolutely. Take care, guys. <laughs>